Hi, Brian. Hello, Amelia. Hi. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you very well, thanks. I, I can hear you well. I sometimes was having trouble hearing Ale there. Some parts of what he was saying went missing, but I think we've... I think we held it together. <laughs> it was pretty. It was. It was a wonderful conversation. I was listening. I was listening backstage, as it were. Um, oh, good, good. Well, I'm pleased you heard it. So, th thank you for appearing here. Nice to meet you. Nice to um, meet you. Too. I was. Um, I have to say, I didn't. I knew your name, but I didn't know much about your work. So I watched a couple of interviews with you. Oh no. Um, <laughs> Well, they were very interesting, and uh, I, I, my own um, relationship with philosophy has been um, quite strained in in a certain area because for the, for the period that I really started becoming interested, there were a lot of philosophers around, um, like Quine and Nozick and so on, who were writing things that made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. And I kept thinking, I must try to understand what these people are talking about. They're obviously not stupid, and um, but what they were talking about seemed to have no relationship at all to anything in my life whatsoever. Um, and in fact, the people I was looking to for philosophy were actually natural scientists, really. People who were examining the world and coming up with ideas about how it got to be that way. And this persisted until I discovered Richard Rorty. Mm. Suddenly I found somebody who was talking about things that I could understand. For instance, he was talking about literature, um, about Nabokov and so on. And so Rorty really brought me back to philosophy in a way, made me think, okay, there is a point in this activity. <laughs> there is some reason for having these kinds of discussions. And then when, when I looked at your, uh, an interview you did with, um, I think somebody called Anne Fitzgerald, possibly her name was, uh, Oxford mm. person. Um, some of the things you were saying, I really warmed to them because they, they seemed to me like they might have had their seeds in Dewey and Rorty and those kinds of philosophers. Um, and I think that seed is really summed up in um, something that Rorty said, which is that, um, I'm trying to remember exactly how he said it, something like truth is a property of sentences and it's us who construct sentences, therefore it's us that construct truth. Um, and I thought, ooh, that's liberating <laughs> and quite dangerous. So anyway, that's that's sort of what I started hearing from you, but perhaps I've misconstrued you. Are there any resemblances between you and Rorty? I mean, I don't accept um, Rorty's view of truth, not because I think the view is dangerous, although I think um, it's interesting to note that so many people have blamed the kind of post-truth politics on basically post-structuralists and post-modern thinkers like Rorty, whereas I actually think Facebook, for example, with its multiple parallel realities has much more to do with the shaping of a kind of post-truth a post-truth logic. But, but Rorty does play this kind of important role in my intellectual biography in the sense that, you know, Oxford is a place that is um, philosophically very much, broadly speaking, in the grip of a kind of philosophy that is exemplified by Quine or Nozick. Um, mm -hmm which as a graduate student felt to me very removed from the things that brought me to philosophy, which I imagine were very similar things to, to the things that motivated you to go look into philosophy. And so there was a secret group of us graduate students who ended up having a reading group on, on Rorty. And it turned out that all of these graduate students who were doing these very kind of Quinean or Nozickian analytic projects had this kind of secret urge for a philosophy that felt somehow more engaged with <laughs> literature and the world. And, and, um, and I remember a faculty member finding out about my involvement in this group, the fact that I was running the group. And he said, well, you know, we expected better of you. <laughs> but it was this oh. space of kind of, um, 
intellectual liberation. Um, even though I didn't, I didn't really remain particularly enchanted with Rorty because, because of one specific thing, which was that he was always talking about the importance of kind of returning to first order practice, right? He obviously has so much reverence for those people who are capable of doing things in the world and making things, artists, political yes. artists. But he's completely yes. paralyzed by his inability to return to the first order and talk about politics. Um, or to do mm -hmm. politics. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and when he does talk about politics, he ends up being quite a boring liberal in many kind of ways. And he doesn't really say anything particularly radical. So I think he's quite freeing at this meta level, but um, he's sort of weirdly politically constipated at the first order level. And so, and, <laughs> and, and, and the time at which he's kind of most politically interesting is when he's talking about feminism but he's not really mm -hmm. doing any work himself. He's just reporting how feminists think about the world. And so, yes. Yes. yeah, so for me, that the, the, the desire for that kind of first order engaged worldly politics is best satisfied by feminist theory, which lots of people don't think of as philosophy, um, but I certainly do. Yes. Yes, well, I think, um, what what Rorty did in in his reportage of feminist theory and actually of um, uh, working class life in America in the twentieth century and the role of unions, for instance, which is something that nobody talks about in America anymore. Unions have completely disappeared as a subject. It's like, don't bore me with that old socialist shit. Right. Um, but actually, he says. He, he talked about unions in a way that really made me think differently about them and and about feminist theory. So, so I think he has to be credited with with making people like me pay attention to things that I probably wasn't noticing otherwise. Um, and I th I think he's a very good. I think there's a role for people who take ideas and repackage them and offer them to you in a way that is quite easy to understand. Those people always get dismissed as like the layman's version or science light or something like that. For instance, uh, somebody the other night was saying to me, oh, well, Dawkins isn't a real scientist, is he? He's just a repackager. And I was thinking about that and I th thought, well, actually most of the people that I think I've learned anything from could probably be described as repackagers. And then I thought with a great moment of shock and actually so am i <laughs> i'm a repackager <laughs> um, because a lot of the ideas that i've used in muse in my music which is a relatively popular music it's not it's not academic it's not off in the back shelves of the record shop um, a lot of them come from people who are in the back shelves of the record shop you know i'm so i'm a repackager too and then then I took some um, consolation in the thing that Picasso said about um, um, something like mediocre artists are copyists, the best artists are thieves. <laughs> <laughs> something of that. <laughs> they, just, they just don't pretend, they just take it and uh, sell it back to you. Well, someone like Harold Bloom, but, um, is, that's what yes. all poetry is. Sorry. Oh, sorry, there's a time lag. <laughs> I was just going to say that someone like Harold Bloom, the, the English critic who recently died, you know, thinks that that is that's a very good way of distinguishing between different kinds of poets, good poets, strong poets. He says, um, basically, you know, steal. They 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 take things, but then they reconfigure them in a way that often involves a denial of the borrowing. Mm. Um, whereas, you know, weak poets simply replicate. Um, and I think, and I think that's actually an, an interesting model for thinking not just of art, but kind of culture more broadly, including politics and language, right? We all um, take up a language that is already given to us, you know, a language and words, a conceptual repertoire, um, a set of practices. And there are kind of implicit choices between simply going on with them and innovating within them. Mm -hmm. but, but innovation, it seems to me, are only intelligible against a background of 
familiarity, right? So it has to be mm -hmm. some sort of mm -hmm. intervention yeah. in something that is communally shared. So this distinction between um, being, you know, being a repackager and being genuinely novel, I think, is in some sense just a, a bad distinction. Yes, yes, I, I completely agree. But this brings us to a very, a very contentious area, which is the question of cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. which of course is, is a very hot topic at the moment. There's, there's no medium in which it's easier to culturally appropriate than music. It's very, very easy to. And in fact, the whole history of pop music is, is an absolutely ongoing process of cultural appropriation. You know, I'm, I'm sure when the, when the history of music is written in 600 years time, there'll be a little area called pop music and it will be a tiny little leaf on a branch of this huge area called African music. Mm. You know, African music is really what pop music comes from mm. uh, with, a, with a little bit of, um, uh, a little bit of um, Appalachian, Scots and Irish music thrown in, but but essentially the thing that distinguishes um, pop music from Western classical music, the thing that makes it new in the West is its embrace embracing of African music. So, you know, we've I am working in an area that is a, a cultural appropriation, and so on the one hand you could say. Well, that's terrible. You you should stop doing that and come up with something original. But what? Whoever has done that? Who has ever come up with anything original? Who has ever come up with something that didn't have roots somewhere else? And in fact, what would be the value of coming up with something that didn't have roots? Um, it would be it would be an entirely abstract. As as you say, there would be nothing to nothing to gauge it against. The you notice novelty when you notice it in relate. It's the difference between mm. it and something else. You know, we what we are alert to are differences, not absolute intrinsic qualities. We're we're alert to this piece of music because it's more jerky, or mm. more ragged, or smoother, or longer, or shorter, or louder, or quieter. But that they're, they're always comparative differences, and so. To me, the implication is that everything we do has to be a cultural appropriation for it to make any sense to us. It has to be a re in reference to something else. Um, and so I, I'm having a lot of trouble lately thinking about that argument. Of course, I realize the pragmatic fact is that Elvis Presley made a huge amount of money. Well, actually his manager made a huge amount of money, Colonel Tom Parker. He made a huge amount of money. And the people that Elvis copied, like Arthur Big Boy Crudup, didn't make a huge amount of money. So clearly this, this is where we should be putting our attention is how do we trace those roots and pay them? How do we, how do we send something back to them? Yeah, I think, I, I think you've got to the heart of it. So I think it's uh, critics have kind of woke cancel culture often um, ignore the kind of material reality that gives rise to these criticisms. So imagine a, a genuinely egalitarian world in which everyone had equal access to things uh, like cultural, the, the means of cultural production. Um, right, so obviously equal access to the basic means of production, but also cultural production, esteem, um, recognition for creative output. I don't think you really would have um, anxieties about cultural appropriation. The, the anxiety comes from precisely the kind of differential um, benefits that are given to people, right, for um, invoking yes, yes. cultural forms. Um, and so that's what needs to be Corrected. So there's always, I think, a kind of legitimate, very legitimate material complaint um, at the heart of, you know, everything that people would like to dismiss as woke 
politics, it's not necessarily specifying it, how things would be in the ideal situation, right? In the ideal situation, mm -hmm. we would we would just all free play all of the time. And we probably also wouldn't be so committed to the notion of cultural and intellectual property as we are, right? Um, mm -hmm. And, but, but I think the worry about cultural appropriation entirely comes from a, um, you know, the, the highly non-ideal reality we have of kind of racial and economic oppression yeah. and, and its attendant kind of uneven distribution of things like recognition, money, and esteem. Um, so yes. whether these, but you know, some, th there are different ways of addressing it, right? So you are someone who throughout your career always points to the roots, both within the, your music itself, I feel like contains these pointers always, um, but then um, you were also explicit about it, right? Because you were, because you have so much to say about the process of making music. Um, and that seems to me an extraordinarily effective way of mm -hmm. thinking in a more complicated way about these issues of appropriation, distribution of esteem. The money thing mm -hmm. is, is outstanding, right? Do we owe reparations? Yes, yes. Well, this, I mean, I this is really a, reparations a, black a, culture, right? Yeah, I, I, th I think it's a real question, and I, I think we do, actually. <laughs> and somehow or another, you know, it's, it's very difficult to think of how, how technically that would work. Um, but it's not impossible. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the music business is that it has developed the most sophisticated system of payments of any cultural form that exists, I think. So, you know, if you look on a single, you'll see the title and the artist, and then you'll see the writers. And there can be, I remember the song, The Lion Sleeps Tonight, for example, has six, six writers, mm. but it doesn't include, it doesn't include the African man that they stole the song from. <laughs> Um, it, you know, it's not impossible that um, it's not impossible that we would relook at that and say, well, in fact, it has happened with that particular song. People have said, okay, we have to pay something to this guy, and his mm. family—he's dead now—but his family received some money for it. But um, in, in because of the copyright system in music, there there is a sort of mechanism for dividing up monies. You know, any record that exists there are probably 25 people earning something from it, producers and people in record companies, artists, writers, so on and so on. So it can be done. Mm. Um, I think the, the problem is that we make such a big distinction. Culturally, we make such a big distinction between the person who has the name, the creator who has the name, and all the other people who, who make something come into existence. This is something that really interests me a lot. How, do, how does an idea come into existence? And I have this notion in my head that new, new ideas are generally articulated by one person, but they're almost always the product of a huge community of people. And this became very clear to me a few years back when I went to see at the Barbican, there was a show of early 20th century Russian painting. Now this was an area that I thought I knew a lot about. It was mm. my favorite area of painting and I'd studied it closely. And in that show, I saw about 75 artists I'd never heard of, along with the ones I had, who were really good, who were obviously working in those scenes in Moscow and St. Petersburg in the early 20th century and who'd got lost in history. Um, but then I started reading about that period and discovering that there were certain patrons who, who were very important, who kept the whole scene running. There were certain critics who talked it up in the way I was just saying about Rorty, people who repackaged it, sold it on, you know. There were salonists, there were girlfriends, who cooked for everyone. Of course. There were, um, yeah, of course, yes. Um, but of course, who never enter the history. You know, those, those kind of people are never talked about as being part of the scene. So I, I came up with this word then, which I've used since, 
So it's the collective form of genius, which I call senius, S-C-E-N-I-U-S. And, and I like this idea that we acknowledge that certain scenes are inherently fertile. There's the right ecology for things to come out of them. You know, there are many of them that you can think of. Liverpool in the 1960s for pop music. Um, um, New Orleans in the late 50s and early 60s also for pop music. Paris in the 50s for film. Um, uh, Xerox labs in the 80s for technology. Um, Silicon Valley now, Palo Alto, Stanford, all these places. And these are all places where the chemistry is right. And what that means is that there's a fertility of people working together, mm. which make it the right place to articulate new ideas. The place where once an idea is articulated, a lot of support will go into it. Mm. It'll, it'll take root immediately. People will try it in lots of different ways. Um, I don't know if you've ever read, there's a great book about the Manhattan Project which was one of the, although it was actually directed towards producing the atomic bomb, it was one of the most extraordinary moments of human cooperation and achievement in, in human history. If, if, only we could, if only we could revive that now and put that kind of in intelligence to with climate change. <laughs> That's <Headline>. right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> so yes, well, it's because I've been having this idea. Later on in this in this series of talks today, there'll, there's a lady called Mariana Mazzucato, yeah. who's who's a brilliant economist and talks extremely well about this idea of where value comes from, mm -hmm. where ideas come from. And one of the examples she gives in her book is she has a iPhone. And she points to all the important technologies in the iPhone, GPS, touch, uh, touch screen, you know, Siri, all, all those kinds of things. And she traces where they all come from. Mm. Do you know where they all come from? DARPA. Well, taxpayer DIA. money. They, they, they come from taxpayer money, exactly. They're social products, actually. They come from defense spending. So lately I've been having this idea is that Instead of resisting that, we should say, okay, we're going to spend all this money on defense, partly because it's the laboratory for blue sky thinking about technology. Why don't we just decide to, decide to refocus defense on the things we need defending against? Not the Chinese, not the Russians, but pandemics, for instance, climate change. Why not take all of that system all of the Manhattan projects that are going now and say, okay, here's the problem you want to be looking at. So, so my headline is, Brian Eno reschedules defense spending. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, I like that too. I mean, it's, um, it, it's so interesting, this question of um, how one, as a creative producer like yourself, um, negotiates the, the fact that, uh, of, the conditions of your own possibility. So I think, for example, of um, the women of the women's liberation movement in both the US and the UK, incredibly intellectually and politically fertile um, and intense moments, right? Uh, movements um, taking place in particular physical spaces um, with a huge amount of kind of emotion, intellectual and political energy. Um, and then what we receive from those movements are a, a, you know, a few key texts that were written by particular women, sometimes written as collectors, but often written by particular women. And then for example, Shulamith Firestone becomes, becomes the kind of stand-in for the entire movement. And the dialectic mm -hmm. of sex is an extraordinary text, but it is produced by um, Yes, a, a huge number of women whose names are often forgotten to history, and I think yes. that's interesting. And actually, that produces a certain amount of tension within the women's liberation movement, right? I mean, how much should be oriented around the cult of individual women intellectual leaders, and how much of this was a kind of communal practice? But I, but the iPhone thing also makes me think of um, 
you know, okay, so there's the question, I have one too, there's the question of, um, you know, where intellectually do the, each of these parts come from? And then there's the question of where materially this comes from. Mm -hmm. And you know, these are precious metals that are mined under bad conditions, um, causing huge amounts of ecological and human harm. Uh, and then these objects are pieced together in profoundly exploitative factories. And it seems to me that it's an ideology of, um, the individual genius, the person who puts in their intellectual labor that supports a whole system that thinks that these, the, you know, the people yes. who actually physically produce these things are in no sense entitled to the benefits of that production. Um, and, and so it's interesting yes. because of course, the, there, there are artistic geniuses. I'm talking to one right now. At the same time, the cult of the genius um, is very tied to the logic of capitalism, right? The logic that says that um, yeah. putting in the, just the hard labor of physically making these things or cooking for the man who then goes on to write the great, great treatise. I mean, none of that really matters. It's, it's, la it's either not labor at all, it's done out of love, if it's labor in the home, mm -hmm. or it's labor that deserves very yeah. minimal kind of compensation. Um, yeah, yes, there's yeah. a kind of yeah interesting puzzle there, I think. But I like yes. I like genius. How do you spell genius? S C E N I U S. Very good. <laughs> um, do you do you know, uh, have you heard of an economist called Kate Rayworth? Um, she wrote a book called Donut Economics. Okay. Yes, I've she's, heard. Of that. She's another. Uh, it's a it's a brilliant book, and part of the message of that book is that, well, I'll state it very simply, um, traditional economics sort of sees an axis between the individual and the state. Okay, so if you, if you focus on the state and make that the prime actor, that's communism. If you focus on the individual and make that the prime actor, that's sort of libertarianism. And most of the economic thoughts we've had are somewhere on the line in between those two. What she's saying is actually there should be another axis that crosses both of those. And that's the axis between care, caring, the stuff that women do traditionally and don't get paid for, and the big scale of caring, which is the environment, the resource that we constantly draw from and don't replenish <laughs> and don't pay attention to. And she says that both of those, both of those poles on that other axis are out of the story because they don't have a financial uh, tag attached to them. We don't, we don't know how to value them. So therefore we don't value them. They don't appear in GDP. They don't appear in economic discourse as a result. So what she's talking about is saying, we need a new economics that includes both of those as well. And I think that thought is so important because it's the same thought that you're having when you say um, this issue of attribution where all the attribution goes to one name is, is clearly wrong. Um, and it's, it's morally wrong and it's economically wrong as well. You know, it shouldn't be the case that that person gets all of, all of the benefit of the process. Um, so I can see we're running out of time, but um, what you were saying had a lot of relationship to what Ayl was saying earlier yeah. about understanding that what we're always looking at is an ecology. It's no use looking at uh, this thing separate from everything else. It's always embedded in an ecology of some kind, and it can be an intellectual ecology or a physical one or an economic one. Sorry, I went on a no, bit no, long no. there. Not at all. I mean, it's amazing because we managed to almost go half an hour without even mentioning the pandemic. But you know, I think. Oh, that's true. <laughs> but the pandemic. Um, or the future, or right. <laughs> but the pandemic really does reveal the kind of contradiction at the heart of kind of the late capital uh, capitalist state, which is you know we're all supposed to be these atomistic individuals, but turns out we're radically yeah. dependent uh, and moreover we're radically dependent on you know precisely those people who uh, whose labor we we don't pay for, pay for 
pay hardly at all. Yeah. Um, so I, I suppose there is maybe some hope contained in that thought. <laughs>